Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you for inviting me to present um, to members of the Civil War Roundtable Congress. It's lovely to be here with you. Um, what a great lineup of speakers you have um, coming to your Fridays. Um, I actually just finished reading Joseph McGill's book and several others there on the list as well. So wonderful to see and so happy to hear you're going to be spending some time in the northern part or the lower part there, as we sometimes call it, of the Shenandoah Valley this summer for one of your conferences. So um, you might perhaps be inspired to visit Newmarket Battlefield, at least that is my hope. Um, when Mike asked me to talk about the Battle of Newmarket, um, certainly a favorite military history topic of mine, um, I had the privilege to write a book about the battle for the Emerging Civil War series. It's called Call Out the Cadets, um, published by Sabas Beatty. I've put a link um, in the chat for you. Um, also, I've written a lot of blog posts about topics that didn't make it into the book. Um, surrounding the Battle of New Market. So again, put a link in the chat if you want to check out that extra information. And last but not least, there is a link at the very top of the chat, the first message there, um, focusing on upcoming events that Virginia Museum of the Civil War, um, which is operated by Virginia Military Institute, um, that they will be hosting at um, their area, their preserved area of Newmarket Battlefield um, in May this year for the 160th anniversary. Um, so if you have questions about any of those, put them in the chat, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and dive into the history. Now I realized that Call Out the Cadets has been out for a few years and I've had the privilege to talk to quite a few round tables um, either virtually or in person, and many of you have probably heard the leadership talk or maybe the, the stories of the cadets um, who moved from Virginia to California or some of the other programs I've been sharing. So I wanted to pull one out that should be fairly new for the majority of you. Um, one of the things that I'm committed to doing with the Battle of Newmarket is continuing to do research about the battle. So even though the book's been out for a few years, I have continued to do research and I'm always finding something new. So what I'd like to do tonight is start off by stretching our thinking just a little bit. Let's have some emerging thoughts, if I can borrow that phrase. So let's think about, is the Battle of Newmarket a single day battle or a three day battle? And before you make a quick decision or before I tell you my answer, let's think about this for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so. How do we classify an opening action militarily in Civil War history, in Civil War memory? Why does a battle happen at Newmarket? We're gonna look at troop movements, how these armies come together for the battle that will be fought on May 15th, 1864. We're gonna look at how the stage is set on May 13th and 14th. We're gonna look at how locals in the Shenandoah Valley recognized this early fighting in their reporting, what they printed in the newspapers on May 20th, 1864. We're gonna use this sort of as a framework for looking at the two opening days of the fights. Now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get some images, we'll get some maps going. So hopefully you can see the screen share. Looks like it's going well on my side. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it to full screen for us. Um, if you aren't seeing it, Mike, let me know. Um, all right, so we're gonna be looking at just before the battle, reevaluating the fighting at Newmarket. So one of the documents I came across um, last year that I thought was absolutely fascinating was reporting in a local newspaper in the Virginia Shenandoah Valley, the Rockingham Register, what they wrote about the battle that happened a little north of them. The battle happens on May 15th, 1864. This reporting is published five days later on May 20th. And um, the editor, the reporter here is a man named J.H. Wartman. And I'll read the beginning of his uh, evaluation, his reporting on the battle. Quote, Sunday last, the 15th of May, will long be remembered by the people now living in the lower end of Rockingham and the upper part of Shenandoah counties. The preliminary military movements for a day or two had all indicated the imminency of a conflict of arms that might occur at any hour between the Confederate forces under that accomplished and fearless leader, Major General John C. Breckinridge, and that wily, cautious, crafty, yet energetic 
Dutch Yankee Commander General Siegel. So let's use that as our opening, if you will, um, as we look at the reporting, the telling of this early fight at the Battle of Newmarket. So let's start by a quick overview of the region. What's happening? Where are we? So the Virginia Shenandoah Valley, it's out in the western part of Virginia, not West Virginia, but the western part. Um, it's The Shenandoah Valley is about 150 miles in length. It's formed by the Blue Ridge Mountains to the east, the Allegheny Mountains to the west. Now, one of the things I like to point out when we're talking about the Shenandoah Valley is directions. Directions are really fun in the valley because if you're moving south in the valley, if you're taking an army south in the valley, it is said you are moving up the valley. And if you are moving north in the valley toward the rivers, the Potomac River, um, you are said to be moving down the valley. Now, I just gave away a little hint about why these directions are seemingly backwards in the Shenandoah Valley. It's because of how the rivers flow. So the Shenandoah River, there's two forks of it that flow through the valley, um, and they are going to be flowing south to north, flowing down north to the Potomac, where they will join, or where the, the Shenandoah River joins the Potomac at Harper's Ferry. So I will do my best in the presentation to either say the armies moved north in the valley or south in the valley, but occasionally I might throw in one of the uh, directions up or down the valley. Just something that's helpful to keep in mind um, if you're reading primary sources from the era and they're writing about the Shenandoah Valley and sometimes even our secondary source authors will uh, use that terminology as well. Now the Shenandoah Valley has deep military significance uh, during the Civil War. It's kind of a backdoor entrance, if you will, to either side's capital, Washington DC or Richmond, Virginia. Whoever controls that Shenandoah Valley can kind of swing around and threaten the other side's capital or supply lines. By the time we get to 1864, the Shenandoah Valley has already seen a lot of fighting, and most significantly is the campaign in the spring of 1862. The 1862 Valley Campaign, fought by Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, in which he will win five out of the six battles he engages in, and essentially drive three Union armies out of that region temporarily. Uh, this is important for the Confederate war effort in the spring of 1862. It gives them some victories that they can feel confident in. In the Shenandoah Valley itself, it sets up this idea that there needs to be a defender of the valley, a Confederate defender of the valley um, who will drive back Union armies. And of course, Jackson is wounded at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May 1863. Um, he will die of pneumonia um, on May 10th, 1863. So he is out as defender of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, next general to take his place, commanding the 2nd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, is Richard Ewell. And at first, people in the valley get really excited because Ewell comes through the northern portion of the valley during the Gettysburg campaign, and he drives out Union General Milroy, who's in the town of Winchester, as part of that campaign. But Ewell is not Jackson, and that becomes evident as more battles and campaigning happens. By the time we get to the spring of 1864, people in the Shenandoah Valley Confederates in the Confederate military in the Shenandoah Valley are looking for their next leader. They're looking for someone who's going to step into Stonewall Jackson's shoes, if you will, and somewhat miraculously drive Union armies out of the region. Meanwhile, we have the Union side who suffered a lot of defeats in the Shenandoah Valley region. There's some Union soldiers who will actually call the region the Valley of Humiliation because they've been defeated so many times in this area, but they keep marching armies in. They keep suffering defeat. So the Union is looking for a victory. The Confederates are wanting to hold on to the region and somehow defend it against the odds like they have in the past. Um, so let's talk about the people now living in Shenandoah County, to borrow the phrase um, from Wartman's newspaper reporting there. 
So Shenandoah County um, is where the village of Newmarket is located, um, and that village is founded in 1769, and it sits at a crossroads. So you have um, what will be the Valley Pike. Um, now, if you're looking at a map or perhaps you've traveled or will be traveling in the Shenandoah Valley, that's modern Route 11. Um, so that runs north-south through the valley. And then there's a road that crosses Route Route 11. Um, so we got a nice crossroads going on. And that crossroads, the east-west one, is going to run over this mountain called Massanutten Mountain um, and then head east. Um, and New Market Gap is the pass over Massanutten Mountain, just above um, the village there. And the importance of New Market Gap is that is where you can cross an army over this mountain that's sitting right in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley, running from about Strasbourg to Harrisonburg and um, Harrisburg, Harrisonburg, excuse me. And you either have to march your armies around it or you need to control New Market Gap. So it has military significance. It's been used in campaigns before. But let's look a little closer here at the region, at the town. Um, according to newspaper reporting from 1835, uh, New Market was, quote, three fourths of a mile in length containing above 100 dwelling houses with a population of 700 persons. The streets are remarkably level, straight and well laid out, nearly parallel with Massanutten Mountain and two miles distant from its base. There are three houses of public worship, one Lutheran, one Baptist, one Methodist, one large and commodious brick academy in which is taught all the branches of liberal and polite education. One book and job printing office, five stores, three taverns, one resident attorney, and four regular physicians. There is perhaps no town in the state of the same size where the me mechanical pursuits are carried on to a greater extent than in this. There are here, in active and extensive operations, one manufactory of threshing machines, two wheelwrights, four cabinet makers and house joiners, four tanneries, two saddle and harness making establishments, two chair factories, four boot and shoe manufactories, three hat factories, one silversmith and jeweler, one coppersmith and tin plate worker, Two gunsmiths, two blacksmiths, one locksmith, one sleigh maker, one saddle tree maker, one diaper weaver, and two potteries, at which one of stoneware of superior quality is manufactured. There are also in the vicinity two forges for the manufactory of pig metal into bar iron, both of which at this time are in active operation. The country around abounds in iron ore of the best quality. Now, I realize that that reporting has a little bit of the ring of the 12 days of Christmas and a partridge in the pear tree, but it gives us a really good glimpse into the couple decades before we get to the Civil War that this is a village that really supports the agricultural community in the area. They're building and repairing wagons. They're building farming equipment, um, and then they have the shops and other small industry there that's both supporting the local area, and then they're also able to send some of those products into other parts of perhaps the county, the valley, or maybe even beyond. Um, the image that we have here on the screen is actually of the village of Newmarket, and you can see the roadway, the Valley Pike, running through the town um, around the time of the Civil War. So fast forwarding a little bit from that reporting in 1835, let's look at the 1860 census. So just on the eve of the Civil War, there's 1,422 people recorded as living in Newmarket. Um, this includes 55 free African Americans, 79 enslaved persons, and 1,288 white people. In the 1860 election, which I love to look at the voting um, returns um, for counties, for locations in the 1860 election, because it's really enlightening to get a sense of where the, the voters, the men, um, were in their thinking and who they're supporting politically. So in the 1860 election, the majority of voters in Newmarket vote for the Democrat candidate John C. Breckinridge. Little imagining that four years later, he would be leading a Confederate army that fights the battle in their town. 
They, um, the village has an active militia unit. Um, they call themselves the 10th Legion of Artillery, which sounds really impressive until you find out they don't actually have any cannons. Um, there was also the New Market Cavalry, and when the Civil War actually happens, these militia units will be incorporated into the Confederate unit that we call Rice's Battery. Um, so they'll go into artillery. Um, during the, the early years of the Civil War, there's troops through the area. The civilians in the area are experiencing the regional war. And part of that is because they sit right along the Valley Pike, that north-south roadway um, that runs through the Shenandoah Valley. It's completed about 1834. And by the Civil War, it's used as the avenue for armies. You can move troops very rapidly along this good road. So when we get to the spring of 1864, we find the Shenandoah Valley placed in the crosshairs of the strategies that are being made at the high level. Now, I'm sure you're familiar because you um, have interviews, I believe, with General Grant uh, and have some great historians um, speaking about him um, regularly at your meetings. So Grant becomes Lieutenant General in March 1864, and he's going to start laying out the strategies uh, that are going to direct Union armies armies in this year of fighting. Grant wants to put pressure on multiple points of the Confederacy. He wants to keep their supply lines threatened, and he does not want Confederate forces to be able to reinforce each other. Um, so in Virginia, this is supposed to play out, or the way Grant wants it to play out on paper, is three-prong attack by the Union. Um, so there'll be one Union force um, fighting the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, it becomes known as the Overland Campaign, and those operations will be happening in the central part of the state. Then we have Benjamin Butler, who's supposed to be threatening Richmond. Uh, we now call it the Bermuda 100 Campaign, and it doesn't go as planned. Uh, Butler kind of gets tied up like a cork in a bottle, as it's sometimes said. And then thirdly, to occupy Confederate troops in the Shenandoah Valley, Union General Franz Siegel is supposed to march south in the valley, capture the supply city of Stanton, Virginia. So let's meet, as our newspaper reporter on May 20th, 1864 called him, that wily, cautious, crafty, yet energetic Dutch Yankee commander General Siegel. Note that the newspaper man misspelled Siegel's last name, um, but I have quoted it exactly on the screen for you. So a little overview on General Siegel. He's born November 18th, 1824 in Baden, Germany. He's educated at Karlsruhe Military Academy, also in Germany. He'll take part in the 1848 revolution where he commands about 4,000 militia revolutionaries. Bad news for Siegel, his side gets defeated in the uprising, um, but he builds a reputation that will be remembered as revolutionaries, including Siegel, um, escape the police in Europe and begin to think about, hmm, maybe we could go to the United States. In 1852, Siegel is going to arrive in the United States, which he calls the land of Washington and Jefferson. He sees the United States as a place where the ideals of liberty can be fostered and grown, and he wants to be part of these ideals of liberty. So he arrives in New York City in 1852. Um, he will move to St. Louis, Missouri, um, where he will become director of the public schools. As well, 12 years later, um, as we're on the eve of the Civil War, Siegel is an influential leader in the German-American community, and he speaks strongly in favor of union. Um, he has this legendary status um, that he still holds from that failed 1848 revolution, and he's able to use his legendary status for recruiting and writing efforts to get the German-American community to support the union war effort and to enlist. Siegel will be one of the earliest political appointed generals of the Civil War on the Union side. Um, he will lose the Battle of Carthage early in 1861, but this loss actually helps to spur his recruiting efforts. Um, he gets appointed to Brigadier General August 7th, 1861, just before the Battle of Wilson Creek, also in Missouri, where he causes a lot of trouble on the battlefield, but manages to get that Union army retreating masterfully off the battlefield. Siegel is good at getting an army off the battlefield, which is 
there's some skill in that, but it's not the skill that's needed for winning victories. He does have a victory at the Battle of Pea Ridge in March 1862, where he commands two divisions. Um, as a result of that victory, he's promoted to Major General on March 21st, 1862. And then Siegel is going to go east. He will actually have fought in the Shenandoah Valley in 1862, going up against Stonewall Jackson unsuccessfully. He fights at the Second Battle of Bull Run, which associates him with another defeat. Siegel will command the 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac um, until March 1863, leaving just in time to avoid the great skedaddle of that corps at the Battle of Chancellorsville. A lot of Union soldiers like Siegel, especially those with German-American background. Um, the phrase, I fight mit Siegel, is popular. Um, his reputation is connected to German Americanism, which is a double edged sword where he has the support of the community, but they also think he's the greatest hero. So there's not a lot of room for him to make mistakes, those kind of learning mistakes that we do see a lot of generals on both sides making during the early years of the war. Um, Siegel is on inactive duty for most of 1863. Spring of 1864 comes around. Oh, it's a presidential election year. Lincoln really wants to get the German-American vote. One way to make himself popular with that community would be to put Siegel back in command. And so we will find Franz Siegel taking command of about 6,275 troops, which he is to march into the Shenandoah Valley following Grant's strategy. To meet Siegel and his advance, according to our intrepid newspaper reporter, uh, comes that accomplished and fearless leader, Major General John C. Breckinridge. So a little background on our Confederate leader for the Battle of Newmarket. Breckinridge is born on January 16th, 1821. Um, he attends several colleges in Kentucky in the North. He attempts to serve in the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, but he sees no combat. He goes into politics, um, serving at state level in Kentucky, his home state, and then eventually he will serve in both houses of the United States Congress. Politically, Breckinridge opposes know-nothingism, um, that nativist political movement sweeping through the country in the um, late 1840s, 1850s. Um, Breckinridge owned slaves. He supported legislation for slavery, but privately he expressed hatred of the institution. Breckinridge was the youngest, and still is in history, the youngest vice president in United States history. He is vice president for James Buchanan. So, leading right up into the Civil War, Breckinridge is in Washington, D.C., seeing lots of things evolving and happening. In the 1860 presidential election, James Buchanan did not run. There were three candidates on the Democrat Party ticket, um, John Bell, uh, Stephen Douglas, sorry, brain, <laughs> brain catching up here, Stephen Douglas and John C. Breckinridge. Um, the vote is going to be split um, those three ways. Uh, the new Republican Party runs one candidate, Abraham Lincoln. And Breckinridge, when it comes to electoral votes, he gets 72 votes. Lincoln gets 180 and wins um, the presidential election. Now, these are the days when senators are selected by the states. So the day that Lincoln's administration takes office, Breckinridge is no longer vice president, and he's certainly not president, and yet his state has chosen him to be senator. Um, and so he will take his oath, take his seat in the U.S. Senate, and the secession crisis is already happening, and Kentucky is a border state, and Breckinridge finds himself in a difficult position. Now, in the 1860 presidential election, Breckinridge isn't out campaigning like we see in our modern um, elect election races today. Instead, he has people that are supposed to be representing him who are out, you know, drumming up support for his platform. Breckinridge's platform, as it's presented in the 1860 election, makes him look a bit like a fire-eating secessionist. At heart, that's not who Breckinridge is. That's kind of who his campaign managers paint him as. And he's very uncomfortable um, with how he's been presented. He's in uh, representing Kentucky. 
Secession is happening. As I mentioned, Kentucky is a border state. Breckinridge is basically hated by both sides um, as he's there in the Senate. During the summer of 1861, Breckinridge's son runs away from home, goes into Tennessee, and joins the Confederate Army. That doesn't look so great for him as a U.S. Senator. Ultimately, through a series of events, um, Breckinridge is targeted and basically told that if you continue on this road, you're going to be arrested for treason. Um, if you're arrested for treason, you're going to go spend a bunch of time in jail until we can figure out what to do. Breckenridge decides, no, not really what I want to do, and he'll follow the footsteps of his son into the Confederacy. He will take command of the Orphan Brigade, um, regiments of Kentuckians. He'll see at battle action at Shiloh, Baton Rouge, Stones River, Jackson, Mississippi, Chickamauga, at Missionary Ridge, his son is captured, his son will eventually be exchanged and rejoin his father safely. Following the fighting at Missionary Ridge, as we're getting to the end of 1863, Breckenridge is in conflict with Braxton Bragg. Lots of Confederate generals got in conflict with good old Bragg. To resolve the issue, or at least transfer the, the issues away from Bragg, um, Breckenridge is moved east. And this is a bit of a promotion for him. It's also taking him away from the issue with Bragg. Um, so he's going to go east. He'll be given command of what is called the Trans-Allegheny Department, which is 18,000 square miles of land in Virginia, a little bit of Kentucky, Confederate areas of West Virginia, basically stretches from the Shenandoah Valley down to the Virginia-Tennessee border and west a little bit into Kentucky. To defend this vast region, which does have strategic and resource reasons for the Union armies to target it, Breckenridge has just over 5,000 troops. When he comes to the battlefield at Newmarket, he'll have about 4,087 soldiers with him, other troops remaining in other parts of the department. So the campaign, which we now call the Newmarket Campaign, begins. Um, the Union Army under von Siegel starts moving in the very last days of April 1864. Um, Robert E. Lee sends a message to Breckenridge on May 1st, 1864, basically laying out the idea um, that, you know, the Union Army that's moving is probably going to strike for Stanton. There's um, Union cavalry that's heading down toward the railroads in the southwestern part of Virginia. And Lee kind of lays out what he's thinking might happen and then basically says, Breckenridge, you're going to have to make the decisions. Um, the campaign is yours to fight, and Lee says, and I quote, these movements in the Western Department will probably be simultaneous with the attack by Grant here, who has been recently reinforced, so it will be impossible to communicate with you. So Grant's plan is starting to work in that these two Confederate forces, Lee's Breckenridge's, are probably not going to be able to mutually support each other as they face this Union, these Union advances at the same time. Also, on May 1st, 1864, Siegel sends a message to Grant, letting him know that the campaign is underway. Um, he believes that there's not a lot of troops in front of him. Um, Siegel's information is not very strong as to what he's going to be facing or even the lack of troops that he's facing in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, but Siegel says they'll be pressing their advance deeper into the Shenandoah Valley, and he's trying to reassure Grant um, that the campaign will go smoothly. Bringing us a map here, and hopefully it's showing well on your screen, I've circled Newmarket with blue, so it stands out a bit. And then if you kind of follow the line of towns um, up in the north, it would be down in the Shenandoah Valley, but up on the map, uh, moving north on the map, um, you'll see Winchester, you'll see Carnstown, you'll see Newtown, Middletown, Strasburg, Woodstock, Mount Jackson, and Newmarket. Um, so Siegel, he gets started leaving Martinsburg, West Virginia on April 29th. By May 1st, he's reached Winchester. He'll spend a few days in that area. On May 5th, he will hold war games because he is convinced that his army needs more training. 
Um, finally, he'll get headed a bit further south again. On May 9th, he's reached Strasbourg. May 11th, he gets really lucky. It's kind of Siegel's version of Special Orders 191. He captures telegrams at the Woodstock Telegraph office that tell him there is no Union force, or excuse me, Confederate force of significance between Siegel's Union army and Stanton, his objective, the Confederate city sitting a bit further south um, along the railroad line that you'll see stretch the railroad line stretching to Waynesboro, Charlottesville, and ultimately connecting over toward Richmond. Um, so that's where Siegel's supposed to go. There's just cavalry in front of him. But once he gets this information, a big rainstorm comes in. And instead of moving rapidly, Siegel decides to wait. Charles Lynch, a soldier in a Connecticut regiment, photograph on the screen there. He describes May 12th and his experience saying, wet through. Between the rain and mud, we are in misery. Duty must be attended to. We are in the field, the enemy's country. What sleep we can get in the mud and rain doesn't amount to very much as we must lie on the ground. We are enduring hardships for our country. Very little growling or complaining from the boys. Now, on May 12th, as Siegel and his army wait in the rainstorm, that is the same day that Breckenridge has assembled his army at Stanton, Virginia. So let's take a closer look at what I like to call Breckenridge's scramble. So on May 8th, Breckenridge arrives in Stanton, and he's going to be gathering together troops from his department because he realizes he needs to come against this threat that Siegel is bringing into that region. So he's going to bring two brigades with him from southwestern Virginia, um, one commanded by Gabriel Wharton, another by John Eccles. He will also send orders on May 10th, 1864 to Virginia Military Institute, requesting that the Corps of Cadets from that military academy be sent to join him as reserve forces. So here Breckenridge is acting upon an offer he had previously received the, that the cadets could join his army if needed. Um, and the road that you see on the screen here, this is a modern view of the Valley Pike. And along this road, along this route, the VMI Corps of Cadets would have marched as they're going to join Breckenridge in Stanton. They have about 257 um, young men, um, ages about 15 to 25, 26, um, in the Corps of Cadets at the time. Meanwhile, while Breckenridge is pulling his army together at Stanton, cavalry um, and partisan commanders like John Mosby, um, McNeil, John and Bowden, they are attacking, kind of nipping at the heels, if you will, of Siegel's army, crossing over into the Shenandoah Valley, disrupting Siegel's supply lines, causing some devastation there. McNeil launches a raid against the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which causes um, some panic in Washington, D.C. as well. So these guys commanded by Brigadier General John D. Imboden. Um, and this brings us to the next point of our newspaper reporter and his version of the New Market Campaign, again, published May 20th. He says, it is known that a part of our forces commanded by Brigadier General John D. Imboden had been holding the enemy at bay and in check, steadily and persistently disputing his passage over every inch of ground in his advance up the valley from Winchester. The enemy, however, came in strong force, his number variously estimated from 6,000 to 10,000, and was evidently prepared to go to Stanton, the terminus of the Central Railroad in the upper part of the valley. Some decided success had attended our arms in the movements of the cavalry. So while Breckenridge is assembling the infantry, he has cavalry out in front of him, helping to delay and uh, make nervous Siegel and his army. Um, Imboden is very aware of the strategic importance of New Market Gap. And as I mentioned earlier, that is the point that you can cross an army over Massanutten Mountain. Um, Imboden is a skilled cavalryman. Um, he is the cavalry commander that Robert E. Lee asked to 
act as guard for the ambulance train um, returning from Gettysburg, and he has experience fighting in the Shenandoah Valley. So he'll be able to fight successful delaying tactics, and he's also keeping an eye on the Union advance and keeping Breckenridge informed. Union cavalry is also out on the move. Um, Siegel wants to make sure that there isn't a Confederate force hiding on the eastern side of Massanutten Mountain. He and his army are sitting on the western side. The western side is where we find Newmarket, the Valley Pike, but he wants someone to go around to make sure there aren't Confederates on that eastern side that he can't see. So he's going to send a detachment of Union cavalry um, from his camp. Uh, they're commanded by Colonel William Boyd, and there will be troops from the 1st New York Lincoln Cavalry, part of the 15th New York Cavalry, um, and Cole's command. And they're going to be sent out on May 11th to scout what um, Luray Valley, which is the eastern side of Massanutten Mountain. By May 13th, 1864, they have reached the eastern side of New Market Gap, which you can see in a modern photograph here on the screen. They're going to ride up a winding road, which has been used by troops before, um, to the top of New Market Gap. There probably weren't as many trees up on that mountain as there are now. And in the words of a Regimental historian, they will, from the height of a thousand feet, look down upon the magnificent scene. So they're looking to the west, out into that main portion of the valley. And they say the valley, with Newmarket in the foreground, lay spread out before them. Just above Newmarket, just north of Newmarket, they could see troops encamped. And farther up the valley, towards Stanton, they could see a baggage train and a herd of beef cattle. So if you need cavalrymen up at the top of the gap, they're looking down, they're seeing troops, and Colonel Boyd is going to make an assumption that Siegel's army has moved quickly, and these are Union troops down at Newmarket, and he should ride down the western side of Newmarket Gap and join the Union army. Let's take a look at the map. You're going to see that this doesn't exactly go as planned. So here on our map, notice to the right, we have New Market Gap in Massanutten Mountain. We see that winding mountain road. We see a line labeled Boyd and that Union Cavalry mark. So this is the fight that's going to occur on May 13th. It's a mostly cavalry fight. So Boyd makes the decision, let's ride down the western side of Massanutten Mountain. His other officers aren't convinced. They say, let's send some scouts down and make sure those are our friends and we're not riding to the enemy. Those scouts head down the mountain. They realize, uh-oh, these are not our friends. We're getting shot at and it's not accidental friendly fire. There's actually Confederate cavalry and you can see some Confederate cavalry there lining up along the bridge um, or near the crossing of Smith Creek. And take a look, they've also positioned some artillery. The land rolls in this area around Smith Creek at the base of Massanutten Mountain so they could position their cavalry, position artillery in this sort of trap that's going to be um, around the road that the Union cavalry is coming down. So the scouts realize there's a problem. They turn to ride back up and tell Boyd, no, no, stop, stop. But Boyd has already started his cavalry column of a few hundred guys down the mountain. You can't just turn horsemen around and go back. It's not that easy on a mountain road. So Boyd and his cavalry column are going to ride into the Confederate line, the Confederate trap there. And here they're going to fight a battle. And it's a short battle. It's a short skirmish might even be the better way to describe it. Um, Charles R. Peterson, who served in the Lincoln Cavalry, wrote his impressions of the fight in his journal. Quote, in less than 10 minutes, two heavy columns of cavalry were charging down on us. So those are the Confederates coming in on the Yankees. Um, one in our front, another in our rear. Two pieces of artillery began to send grape and canister at short range through our ranks. Our 300 men stood firm, awaiting their attack until they were close upon us. Then drawing our sabers, we charged the column, driving it before us. But owing to the nature of the ground, it was impossible to break through. The only alternative was to turn about and charge those in the rear, breaking through the lines, taking to the mountains, which was close at hand. This was done. Our loss proves the hardest kind of fighting. 
and I am one of the seven of Company B taken. So while Peterson has been captured, survivors of the Union Cavalry Column are going to scatter into Massanutten Mountain, eventually rejoining Siegel's army in disarray and with a tale, a correct tale, that there is Confederate cavalry at Newmarket and keeping an eye on Newmarket Gap. John and Bowden and his cavalry in the May 13th, 1864 fight drive off this Union column and they hold on to the key position, that crossroads at Newmarket. And Bowden sends a message to Breckenridge saying the enemy is advancing. He occupies Mount Jackson. My advance is at Roods Hill. I will make a stand here against his cavalry. But if he gets up his infantry and artillery before your reinforcements reach me, I shall be forced to retire. Lacey Springs, nine miles this side of Harrisonburg, is the next position in which we should have any advantage of the ground. By what hour can I expect support here? Imboden is thinking about position. Imboden is looking for a place to hold on to so Breckenridge and the arriving Confederate infantry will be able to make a stand. Imboden's thinking militarily and he's thinking topography, position, when does Breckenridge arrive? Let's pick up with that newspaper reporting from May 20th. Not always accurate, but it gives us that perception of what people were thinking about and how it was first told to them. On Friday evening, that would be uh, May 13th, and Saturday morning, May 14th, General Imboden outgeneraled and entrapped the Yankees and taking a number of prisoners with their horses and trappings. Captain Chrisman's company of the Rockingham Reserves captured some 17 or more federal prisoners. On Friday evening, May 13th, we had scattered in flight and on Saturday morning captured parts of a regiment. Two a regiment or two of federal cavalry under the notorious Boyd, who had paid us a visit to Harrisonburg last December. This general had come up the Page Valley expecting to find General Imboden at Rude's Hill or General Siegel at Newmarket, but he was slightly mistaken in his calculations of the program. General Imboden was neither at Rude's Hill with his rear exposed to attack through the gap of Massanutten Mountain, nor was Siegel in Newmarket. Boyd came charging down the gap of Massanutten, only to find Imboden ready to give him a hospitable reception. He discovered too late that he had made a mistake and sought to save himself and the plundering horde of vandals with him by a precipitant retreat down a road running along the base of the mountain. Here they were chased, driven, and stampeded and sought security by hiding themselves in Massanutten Mountain. Saturday morning, our cavalry, Confederate cavalry, were engaged in the agreeable pastime of hunting them and bringing them in as prisoners of war. This is not partisan reporting at all, and please be laughing because that is a joke. But it gives us an idea of what's being reported locally about these fights before the big battle on May 15th. Siegel is going to be moving blind by the time we get to May 14th. He's dividing his army in some very strange ways, and he will send infantry ahead of his main body, about 20 miles ahead of where he is with the rest of the force. So he's sending this detachment, and he's going to have them all strung out along the Valley Pike for about 20 miles. This excuse me, brings us into the fight of May 14th. And I promise we're getting to the 15th and the cadets, and I do have my eye on the time. So we have some reporting that the cavalry, Confederate cavalry is going to fight delaying tactics. Think tactics like we see John Buford employing um, at Gettysburg, where you're going to fight ridge by ridge, moving back, moving back. Um, early on May 14th, Imboden is going to send a message to Breckenridge, letting him know about the fight on the 13th, uh, that he's captured a lot of prisoners, and that there's more Union troops advancing, this time from the north, coming down the Valley Pike. 
Um, about 6 p.m., the Union troops will arrive near the village of Newmarket, having pushed Confederate cavalry from high ground position, high ground position throughout the day. So they've actually advanced quite a ways. Um, and Bowdoin is going to make the choice to give up the town of Newmarket, but he's going to hold on to a key piece of high ground, and that's called Shirley's Hill. If you're looking at the map on the screen, you, if you spot the town of Newmarket, look just to the left and you'll see Shirley's Hill there. And a Union cavalryman from the 15th New York will describe what happens as he and his troopers come in sight of the town of the village of Newmarket. He says, they charged and drove them, the Confederates, through the town until our advance was checked by artillery fire. I discovered their formation on Shirley's Hill. On my return north of town, I met a staff officer who ordered me to deploy as pickets. My line extended from east of the pike west, covering the entire front and not more than one half a mile from the town. Union is still moving in a bit of a blind. They don't know exactly where Breckenridge is. They know they've been fighting in Bowdoin's cavalry all day. Breckenridge is on his way. Um, he is bringing up his full force. They will come up in the night of May 14th and 15th. And as I mentioned, we have the Union Army strung out for 20 miles of road. So... Here's a closer look at a map showing us the fight um, toward Newmarket on May 14th. Again, Imboden's going to hold on to that key high ground position. Meanwhile, in the night of May 14th to 15th, um, we're going to have the Confederates forming um, a connection. So cavalry and infantry will come together. Um, on the screen is an image, the photograph is of Colonel Moore, who's commanding the infantry advance, um, which has reached Newmarket. The statue is uh, the Massachusetts statue in Winchester National Cemetery. Um, so Breckenridge's infantry is going to come up um, in the night and be able to use the high ground that Imboden has saved for them. And it's here that preparations for the large battle of May 15th are going to begin. Um, on the screen is a picture of Cadet John S. Wise, um, son of former Virginia governor. Um, he's in the Virginia Military Institute Corps of Cadets um, who have arrived with Breckenridge. Um, Cadet Wise, in the night of May 14th, um, describes evidences of the fighting that had been happening around Newmarket um, while the infantry is still coming up. He says, evidences of the approach of the enemy multiplied on the second day. We passed a great many vehicles coming up the valley with people and farm products and household effects and a number of herds of cattle or other livestock all escaping from the Union troops. Now and then a weary, wounded cavalryman came by. Their report said that Siegel's steady advance was only delayed by a thin line of cavalry skirmishers who had been ordered to retard him as best they could until Breckenridge could march his army down to meet him. And he goes on in his reminiscence and he says, the dreams of our lives, the cadets' lives, were soon to be realized when we learned beyond a doubt that Ron Siegel and his German hosts were sleeping not far from where we lay. Uh, Breckenridge brings up his army in the night to being able to take possession of this high ground, Shirley's Hill, that Imboden has held for him. And holding Shirley's Hill, making that decision on May 14th to keep that high ground is going to be key for how the battle on May 15th, what we traditionally call the Battle of Newmarket, um, unfolds. For the Battle of Newmarket, on May uh, 15th, 1864, here's an image looking from Shirley's Hill, that excellent piece of high ground we've been talking about. Of course, Interstate 81 wasn't cutting through the scene at the time, but you can see this high ground looking toward the village. You can see um, Newmarket Gap there in Massanutten Mountain. Breckenridge is going to bring his infantry up into this position, and we'll use the maps just briefly. Um, Breckenridge will offer battle to the Union um, pickets, the Union regiments in the area for the morning of May 15th. And around noon that day, uh, Breckenridge is going to make the decision to turn the battle from his perspective, from defensive to offensive. Um, he's received new information about um, 
troop movement in other parts of his department and that Lee needs Siegel defeated because he needs Breckenridge's reinforcements in the overland campaign. So Breckenridge is going to put his infantry into a long line of battle. He'll keep the Virginia Military Institute cadets as reserve. And he'll begin to advance this line of battle, and they'll push the Union troops through three defensive positions. We find the Union troops' defensive positions on Manor Hill, which you can see fighting there um, on the map to the left. Then they'll be pushed out of the River Road line. And finally, the Union troops will make their last stand at the Bushong lines. And it's at the Bushong lines where Breckenridge's thin infantry lines uh, gap will form in the middle of those Confederate lines. Um, Union attacks are still coming toward the Confederate line. Breckenridge will make the decision to put in the Virginia Military Institute Corps of Cadets saying, put in the boys and may God forgive me for the order. The Virginia Military Institute cadets will join the battle um, along that Confederate line. There is the urge to move forward, to charge, to attack the Union line. Um, this will happen kind of unit by unit, including the um, VMI cadets who will capture a cannon. Siegel's troops are pushed into a retreat. They will retreat back toward um, a branch of the Shenandoah River beyond, um, so further north. Um, they will cross there, burning the bridge behind them. So Siegel's are army escapes, the Confederates win a victory. And a lot of this is going to have to do with the fact that Breckenridge is able to come up to a high ground position. And Siegel has his army strung out over 20 miles of ground. Union troops are coming into the fight of Newmarket tired. Um, they're coming in piecemeal, we would call it. Um, so when we think about the Battle of Newmarket, yes, May 15th is important. And if you want to get deeper into that, happy to take questions. You might also want to check out um, the book that I wrote for the Emerging Civil War series, Call Out the Cadets. But what I'd like to wrap up with us thinking here is the preliminary movements of a day or two. So looking previous on the timeline, on the calendar to May 15th, Looking at May 13th, May 14th, the fighting that happened, the cavalry fight on the 13th, the cavalry infantry fight on the 14th, really lays some groundwork for how the big battle, if you will, on May 15th evolves. So were these two days key to the battle on May 15th? I would argue yes, because it is establishing the position that the Confederates are able to use. On the screen is another view of Shirley's Hill. That is high ground worth having, and John and Bowden knew that. So let's circle back to the other thing I started with. Should we consider the Battle of Newmarket a three-day battle? Oh, this is getting perhaps controversial here. Um, how do we consider and define multiple-day battles? Casualties, comparatively, are relatively low on May 13th and 14th. The troops that are on the fields, they're not the full armies on May 13th and 14th. In the battle reports, it becomes questions of who is there, who's writing the report, whose voices are remembered. When it comes to the veterans writing about the Battle of Newmarket, you have the cadets doing a lot of veteran memory work, which is so important for understanding the battle, but they're not there for the cavalry fight or the cavalry infantry fight on the 14th. Um, so there's a little bit of controversy there. How much record do we have of these early fights? And perhaps because we haven't had as much study into it, it's been a little bit ignored. Um, that's certainly the way it's been in a lot of the historiography, although the early fighting is certainly mentioned in many of the, the volumes that have been published on it. So ultimately, I am hesitant to suggest that we should view Newmarket as a three-day battle. However, I feel strongly that we need to continue examining the so-called preliminary fighting. There is more research that needs to be done and more interpretation to explore at Newmarket. The May 15th battle would not have unfolded the way it did without the Confederate possession of Shirley's Hill and the Union Army strung out along the Valley Pike. Even if we isolate those points and look no further, there is a strong case that understanding May 13th and 14th combat near Newmarket is vitally important for understanding the more famous day of battle. Thank you. Okay. So to begin with, uh, Sarah has a link 
to the Virginia Museum of the Civil War at Newmarket Battlefield. And a um, uh, another link uh, to a blog post from the Emerging Civil War, and perhaps where you can purchase her book, Call Out the Cadets. And let's see here. Michael says, why was Breckenridge targeted for being guilty of disloyalty while he was a U.S. Senator? Ooh, good question. Um, so Breckenridge is in a difficult position. Um, he feels a very strong responsibility in the spring of 1861 to do what the state of Kentucky wants. Um, Kentucky is a border state. And it's, it will be a border state um, for the war. So slavery is allowed um, in Kentucky. And it's one of those states, will they join the Confederacy? Will they join the Union? Ultimately, they're going to stay in the Union. Uh, but that decision is made after Breckinridge's time, so to speak, um, in political power there. Um, so he's there's the difficulty of his son has decided to join the Confederacy, which is not a great look if you're a U.S. senator. Um, so his son is going and joining what is seen as this rebellion. And then Breckinridge ends up going to a a picnic, which turns into a bit of a political um, situation, and there are some speeches made. He's kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the authorities are really looking at him, and they're concerned uh, that he might join the Confederacy or that his judgment is going to be impaired. Um, so there's a lot of concern with that. Um, it's actually after he decides to go and join the Confederacy that um, a judge says that if he's captured, um, he will be tried for treason. Uh, Breckinridge, after the Battle of Newmarket, he continues his Confederate uh, military career. Um, he will become Secretary of War for the Confederacy in the final months. And um, when the Confederacy falls and when Richmond falls, um, Breckinridge is going to be making a run to get out of the country um, because he is one of those in the Confederacy that actually has um, a warrant out for his arrest. Um, he'll make it out of the country. He'll spend some time in Canada and Europe, eventually be allowed to return to the United States, um, but dies at a fairly young age. So um, there's a lot with Breckenridge. Um, it's often beyond what I can, can cover um, in this type of presentation. I would recommend the lengthy biography by William C. Davis. Um, Breckenridge, a soldier statesman symbol, I think is the title. Um, that's a really good book for looking into Breckenridge's political views and um, those difficulties in 1860 and 1861. Beautiful. Uh, Chris, Christina would like to know, you mentioned General Siegel was inactive during 1863. Was he injured or unassigned or where did he retreat to? Great question. Um, so Siegel um, in 1863, um, once he leaves the 11th Corps um, in March of that year, he's unassigned. Um, he's had problems um, with his, he, he's not winning battles and uh, there's, there is prejudice against German Americans, of course, at the time of the Civil War. Um, so that's coming into play as army politics are happening as well. Um, so he's, he's unassigned. It's something that's very unpopular with the German American community, which is part of the reason um, Lincoln is looking to boost popularity by bringing Siegel back to command in the spring of 1864. Um, with his defeat at Newmarket and Siegel doesn't, Siegel initially doesn't sugarcoat it. As he's leaving the battlefield, he's saying things like he wished he could have died um, on the field of battle rather than suffer this defeat. Um, when it comes time to write reports to General Grant and his um, official papers, he begins to start looking for blame or saying that the Confederates had a lot more troops. It's interesting to see how perception shifts. Um, Siegel won't have another active field command following the Battle of Newmarket. Um, he continues to be patriotic in support of the Union cause and President Lincoln. Uh, following the war, he has a successful career as a newspaper man. Um, he does not see himself as defined by his failures of the Civil War, although unfortunately, sometimes in our Civil War studies, we only look at his military defeats. 
So Norm asks, what was the weather on the 13th and 14th? Was it as rainy as on the 15th? Great question. Um, there is a lot of rain um, that's happening in the Shenandoah Valley um, in that whole week leading into the battle. So um, my understanding at this time in my re um, closer research on those 13th and 14th days of, of fighting, um, it's probably a bit of rain and clouds, rain and sun, so rain off and on. Um, I don't think it was raining the entire time, um, but certainly rain is factoring in, and that's going to play a huge role in the condition of the roads, the conditions of the fields, of course, um, and also the rising of the creek and river waters, um, which prevent some effective maneuvering um, by Confederate cavalry on May 15th. And uh, it had an influence on the name of the uh, the video at the uh, uh, at new, the New Market Battlefield, right? Yes. So um, the field where the Virginia Military Institute cadets made their charge is often referred to as the Field of Lost Shoes. Um, that is because that that field, which belonged to the farmer Jacob Bouchong, had recently been plowed. The rain has turned it into a big, muddy quagmire. And as the cadets and other Confederate troops make their charge across that field, the mud is so deep that it's literally pulling the shoes off their feet. Um, so it becomes known as Field of Lost Shoes. Um, people often ask, or the follow-up question often is, well, what happened to the shoes? Uh, well, we know that the cadets went back and got some of the shoes because they wrote about it um, in their post-war writings, uh, but also other Confederates or civilians would have pulled those shoes out of the mud because it's 1864. Supplies are in tight demand in the Confederacy, so leaving leather in the mud is not something they're going to be doing. The bill says it's relevant to note that the Battle of Spotsylvania is underway during this action, and one has to surmise that General Lee is looking for reinforcements to join the Army of Northern Virginia. Absolutely. That's a great observation. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, when, we're, when I have when I do my program that looks at the, the campaign in the larger sense, because there is also a movement that's happening um, out through West Virginia at the same time, um, we really look at that and look at the maneuvers in the Shenandoah Valley as military movements happening on Lee's far flank or very extended flank. Um, and perhaps that might be a bit of a stretch at times, but yes, these are very connected campaigns. And part of Breckenridge's decision on May 15th um, to move from defensive posturing into an offensive battle is based on a telegram that he has received from Lee, which says, if you can defeat Siegel, you need to come east and help me fight Grant. Um, at the same time, Breckenridge had received a message from his troops fighting out in southwestern Virginia that the Union Cavalry column in that part of his department had been turned back. So at that point, the only active Union threat that Breckenridge is facing is Siegel. So he's going to make that decision with those two telegrams to turn um turn offensively on Siegel. Um, and that is, he is able to accomplish his objective, which ultimately defeats um, one of Grant's strategic purposes because Breckenridge is able to move reinforcements to join Lee. And Breckenridge's force will join uh, just before the Battle of Cold Harbor, so around the beginning of June, 1864. One of the follow-up questions I always get with this is, did the VMI cadets go with Breckenridge? No, not really. Um, the cadets do go to Richmond, um, but they do not fight at Cold Harbor. They go to Richmond, they get a new flag, they get a lot of praise um, from Jefferson Davis and other Confederate leaders there, and then they're going to briefly go back to Lexington, Virginia. They'll be there just a short time, and then the, the cadets are forced to flee as another Union army comes through and actually burns the barracks um, at Lexington. John says, well done, Sarah Kay. So, <laughs> forthwith, Consider New Market a multi-day battle. Well, at least at least keep in mind that there's some early fighting that really sets it up. Thank you so much. Glad you enjoyed it. Mary asks, how was Siegel viewed after this? Oh, great question. Um, I think I answered it a little bit before, so I'll just I'll keep it short here. Um, he's not going to get another active command, so that tells you kind of militarily 
not cool. Um, so um, that's probably not a great way to put it. But he's he's not going to be trusted with another army um, during the Civil War. Um, he's had another defeat. He didn't accomplish Grant's purposes. Um, so militarily, he's not viewed well. Um, Siegel still remains beloved by the German-American community. Um, he goes on to have a successful career as a newspaper publisher. He's still influential um, in parts of American society. So, um, and there's some blog posts that I've written. Um, Dave Powell has written an excellent book focusing on Siegel and the New Market campaign and really gets into some of the details. And, you know, has Siegel been unfairly judged um, for the New Market campaign? Um, he was going up against a lot of things. He did make some poor command decisions. Um, but I, th I personally think he's been viewed a bit too harshly. Um, and certainly he's been judged by his military defeats. And maybe we haven't looked at the social um, advances that he was part of um, in 19th century America. David says, thank you for this superb presentation. Well, thanks for being here, David. And George from Sacramento says, hi, Sarah. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Good to see you, George. It's been a while. Nice to see you here. And Jim says, uh, can you tell those of us that don't recall what happened to the VMI cadets in the battle? Absolutely. Um, so the Virginia Military Institute Corps of Cadets is about 257 young men um, who go into the battle. Um, they act as reserve for Breckenridge's army as they begin that advance around noon on May 15th. Um, in that reserve, um, the cadets will come under artillery fire as they move down the northern slope of Shirley's Hill. Um, they will reform ranks and continue moving down the slope in good order, winning the admiration of Confederate veterans who had previously been making fun of these young men. The Confederate battle line continues to sweep the Union troops um, through the different defensive positions. As I mentioned, the cadets will fight on the Bashong lines. They'll make that charge um, across the open field, capturing a cannon. Um, at that point, Breckenridge is going to pull the cadets out of the battle line. So they're not going to be part of the rest of the pursuit of the Union army on that day. Ultimately, uh, 10 cadets will lose their lives as a result of the New Market campaign. Um, some killed instantly on field of battle, um, some mortally wounded, and one or two um, dying of illness um, campaign related. Um, so 10 cadets are the casualties for the Corps um, as a result of the Battle of New Market. Um, Virginia Military Institute um, honors the memory of those young men, um, and all of them are listed as died on the field of honor. So Karen says, uh, well done presentation. And uh, you just answered this question, how many cadets lost their lives in the battle? But her other question is, could the Confederates have won the battle without the cadets? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so 10 cadets lose their lives as a result of the battle. Oh, tough question. The cadets certainly thought the answer to that question would be no. The Confederate or the Confederate Army could not have won without them. Um, I think it was really important that the cadets filled the line or filled the gap in Breckenridge's line. Um, the 34th Massachusetts. The more that I'm studying them, um, their Union regiment um, essentially across the across the battlefield um, from where the cadets will come into place. Uh, they are definitely making some strong charges, some strong offensive movements against the Confederate line. So I think it's really important that the cadets filled the gap in the line um, and certainly for the cadet memory and memory of the battle for, Virgi for Virginia Military Institute. It was really important they captured the cannon. Maybe other troops could have captured it. Maybe not. That's a hard what if. And there's a lot of memory tied around it as well. John says orphan brigades with or without uh, Breckenridge actions, still one of my very, very favorites. Absolutely, John. Um, the, so funny story, when I was reading Civil War books a, a long time ago, like in my early teens, um, I came across the Orphan Brigade and I literally thought, oh, 
it's made of all orphans like why would you put all those guys who lost father and mother together was it like some sort of uh therapy or something um and of course and i'm sure you you know john but maybe it's new for other other listeners the orphan brigade it's it's kentucky regiments and they referred to themselves that way because their mother state did not secede and join the confederacy so although they were kentuckians fighting in the confederate forces they were orphaned um because they didn't have home support so absolutely very interesting unit to study lots of great action in the western theater uh, Peter says, thanks for a great presentation and perspective. Two questions. What, what was Lee's response to the battle? And was the then uh, later transfer of early to the valley rebuking uh, Breckenridge's leadership to and at New Market? Great questions, Pete, and really nice to see you here on this Zoom. Um, Lee's response is yay. I, I'm, I'm going to put this into modern phrasing. Um, yay, the, the Union troops are temporarily not, act, not active in the Shenandoah Valley. And yay, I'm going to get some reinforcements. So Lee is satisfied with what Breckenridge did in the Valley. He Breckenridge is able to accomplish the objectives that he needed to. Um, no, I don't think that it's good to that, that we would want to view um, early going to the valley later in 1864 as a reflection on Breckenridge's leadership. Breckenridge is doing um, well, Breckenridge will end up, I'm oh, sorry, think an order of battle here. I'm pretty sure he is with Early when they go back to the Valley. And then later in the war, he's going to end up Secretary of War. Um, and he does he he does a good job in that position, except it's at the very end of the Confederacy. So he doesn't have a lot to work with at that time. But um, no, I don't think seeing Breckenridge as not in command of the later 1864 campaigns that, that does not reflect on his performance at Newmarket. But really good question. Thanks for bringing that up. Roger says, fantastic presentation. Your book will be added to my library. And thank you for all you do. Well, thank you so much, Roger. Thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy the book. If you haven't been to Newmarket yet, I hope that you're able to make a visit there. Larry uh, asks, how is your book on the gallant Pelham coming? Oh, well, I have good news. Um, the manuscript um, is complete and with the editors. Um, I'm sure they'll be sending it back to me for some corrections, um, but it's it's going very well. We should have some good news to announce uh, later this year if all stays on target. Uh, Michael asks, can you tell talk <laughs> about the prejudice against German soldiers in the Federal Army? Also, were there German units in the Confederate Army? Ah, good questions. Um, so a lot of it is going to stem from mid 19th century society. So it's not just an army problem. Um, there was a lot of, well, some Americans found it unpopular that um, Germans were immigrating um, from, from Europe and a lot of them coming over as a result of the failed revolutions <laughs> that were happening over there. So um, there's a couple of waves of German immigrants that come to the United States. Um, there's a wave that comes in the 1830s. Actually, one of my ancestors um, comes over at that time. And then, of course, there's the 1848 revolutions, um, which is going to bring more revolutionaries um, to American shores. Um, it tends to be a clash of not understanding each other's culture. Um, and kind of like we talk about the Irish and Irish Americans and the Civil War. Um, the German Americans see the Civil War as an opportunity to prove their patriotism, prove their love of this new country. They really love the United States and want to prove their patriotism, want to be accepted as and seen as good citizens. Excuse me. Um, so that's the mentality of a lot of the German-American soldiers. Now, when we get to Union troops, Civil War military, um, there's differences. You have some heavy accents. Um, you have differences of military thought. 
you really see that with Siegel. He's relying on his training from Karlsruhe Military Academy, which is military training in a European tradition, um, which is a little bit different than how Americans, uh, particularly the volunteers in the Civil War, um, wanted to approach warfare. So there's some, some differences there, but a lot of it is just coming from that prejudice um, against the immigrants um, in that earlier part of the 19th century. Um, were there German units in the Confederate Army? I'm going to be really honest. I I do not have a good answer on that for you. If you want to email me, I'd be happy to look into it. I know I have some resources on my shelf at home that I know I could give you a good answer from, but I'm actually not at home right now. I'm on the road. So um, please email me. I would love to look into that for you and give you a better answer, but I don't want to misspeak tonight. Bill says that's referred to as boot sucking mud. <laughs> Absolutely. And John says, uh, outstanding presentation. See you in August at ECW. Thanks, John. As a matter of fact, I approached Sarah last August to ask her to do this presentation. Joe says, you mentioned 55 free Blacks in Newmarket and just 75 slaves. Are there a lot of free Blacks in the Valley? I wouldn't say that there's a lot, um, but there's more than we might guess. Um, I would like to recommend Jonathan Noalis's book um, that came out, I think, a couple years ago uh, that really focuses on African-American history in the Shenandoah Valley. That's a really good book for looking at that. Karen says, do you view Siegel as a political appointee general? Rather, Lincoln wanted him so more German-Americans uh, would join the Union. Yes, um, and this is not just my opinion here. Um, Siegel has been viewed as a political general, uh, both during the war and by later biographers and historians as well. So yes, um, he is a political general. I think one of the things that makes Siegel a little bit different and that what we should keep in mind is he he did have a military background, kind of, sort of. <laughs> so he did go to a military academy um, in Germany. Um, he did command some militia unsuccessfully um, in Europe. So I would put less emphasis on the militia experience in Europe, a little more em emphasis on that he had a military training, um, which he really does allow to influence his thoughts um, in many ways. Um, so yes, he's definitely a political general when it comes to the Civil War but he has a military enthusiasm and some level of military knowledge, which I think is important to keep in mind. Frank says, thanks for your pre-battle action. Um, I was not aware that there was any at all. Uh, this has answered questions I have had a long time. Well, thanks so much, Frank. I'm so glad you could be here. Um, you know, earlier in the last week or so when I was thinking, I want to talk about for new market. I was like, let's do something maybe a little bit different. Um, and if you want to pursue more about the cadets and the, the May 15th battle, there's great resources out there. Um, William C. Davis's book is a good in-depth one. Um, Charles Knight's book, Thunder in the Valley, is also really good. Um, so yeah, there's there's really, really good resources. Um, but I think it's fascinating to take that little step back and go, how did these armies get to the get to the battlefields what else might have been happening and really how do we view the fighting or the pre-battle fighting or is it skirmish fighting like how do we view that that's something i've been really intrigued to look at with several battles recently uh michael says not historically accurate but the cadet actions uh portrayed comically in john wayne's film the horse soldiers Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think someone always does. It's always delightful. So yes, John Wayne, the horse soldiers. The movie is actually supposed to be about um, Gerson's raid um, through Mississippi and, and Western theater stuff. But um, there are some cadets from a military academy who go out and uh, fight some Union cavalry. And it's it's quite entertaining, and there's parts of it that, yes, it's certainly inspired um, by VMI, by Newmarket. Um, my big pet peeve, if you will, with the with that portrayal there is they make the cadets like 12 years old. So that's one of the things that I'm always coming up against is like, no, no, they were they were in their teens. Like a lot, the average age of the VMI cadet at Newmarket was 
just under 18. So like they're an age, an average age um, of a lot of soldiers who are already in the in the ranks, in enlisted ranks on both sides. Um, and that that's a whole uh, another thing that we could look into with demographics. It's really fascinating, the demographics of the Corps of Cadets. Um, but yeah, it's not 12 year olds. <laughs> And the horse soldiers um, definitely gives that impression. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I may not be able to find it quick enough. No, I'm not going to be able to. But if you go to the link that I put in the chat um, to the blog post I've written for Emerging Civil War, or if you just go on EmergingCivilWar.com, type in uh, New Market Movies, um, you should find a whole blog post that I wrote about New Market in film. Because it's actually been featured in a few other movies as well. Thanks for pointing that out. John says a couple of thousand Germans served in the Confederacy. San Antonio, Texas had a large German population. Thanks for adding that. So are there other questions or comments? And while I'm waiting, uh, I know that, uh, that Lincoln uh, had been involved in a German language newspaper. Was <laughs> he a part of that paper? I I do not know, Mike. That's a really interesting question. Not sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, and Frank says, uh, thanks, Sarah and Mike. And Karen says, thanks again. Outstanding talk. Best explanation of that battle I have ever heard. And Vicky says, thanks for a great presentation. Well, thanks so much. Um, if you're going to be in the Shenandoah Valley, perhaps going to Winchester um, for the, the Civil War Roundtable Congress, I hope you'll be able to stop by the battlefield. Um, if you are able to um, pick up a copy of my book, there's a tour in there um, and it actually takes you to some tour sites. There's a really cool way that you can go up to the top of New Market Gap. Um, you can drive up there. You don't have to hike. Um, but then you can walk about a block and you can see the old roadbed where Colonel Boyd and his Union Cavalry would have come, or if you want to stand there and imagine Stonewall Jackson stories, that's where Jackson and his corps uh, marched east when they were heading to Fredericksburg. So um, places like that, places that go beyond the state park area are also included in that tour. So hopefully you can find that a helpful resource. So um, thanks so much. Great to be here tonight. Uh, John says, uh, will there be a link to this talk to share with other CWR team members? Of course there will on our YouTube channel. Um, but I would suggest that if you want to share this talk with other roundtable members, that you fill out an email and and uh, make sure that it's addressed to sarah.byerly at gmail.com. Thank you. <laughs> I'll do my best to respond to questions, inquiries for talks, etc. Um, I'm on the road this weekend, um, so it may be beginning of next week if, if you are a fast emailer. Um, but look forward to uh, hopefully being able to help. All right. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Sarah, for, uh, for finally being with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope to see you next Friday. And uh, in the meantime, have a great weekend. Good night, everyone.